And Simona, the word to you. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Simone. And uh, mm, yeah, I'm here today to talk a bit about uh, Git uh, with you, uh, all of you. Um, please uh, let me know if you don't hear me well, or uh, also, of course, if you have questions or, or anything that you want to say, uh, you can either just jump in or uh, raise your hands. Uh, I think there is a function in Zoom. I've not used Zoom for a very long time now, uh, so uh, should work still. Uh, yeah, as I was telling Leif, um, I'm also like uh, in a place which is a bit suboptimal in the, in the house. I'm currently in Lisbon um, and the other people. So if there is sound, just someone stop me and if you cannot hear me well. So this is a bit of housekeeping and now we'll share my screen. And so we can, uh, uh, yeah, get started. All right. So, uh, can you all see the uh, first slide? Uh, all right, let me just pull up chat. Nice, cool. So, um, let me see. Okay, now. So, um, uh, let's start for like what uh, this. Uh, talk is about, um, well, it's about Git, and I think I will go quickly through the basics of Git. Um, probably you know about it and probably you've used it sometimes, uh, but just to refresh and make sure that everyone is on the same, uh, same level. And I will try to really go as quickly as possible into things which are more interesting, which is branching, uh, all the things about merging, rebasing, how to not annoy your coworkers and mess up the whole uh, Git history. And uh, then we will really try to go quickly into the team workflows and, um, of course, talk about pull requests and how to use Git in, on GitHub and, and other more practical things. Feel super free to ask me really everything. Um, uh, and, and also, uh, and I understand this, this course about uh, architecture decision and how to essentially go from ideas to a real uh, working project. So anything around that uh, is. Uh, can be can be interesting matter of discussion. So what this is not about, um, I will not tell you how to start Git on your computer um, because you should have probably already done it or you should check it up on the internet. It's very easy. Um, and I will not use uh, GitHub or Git clients uh, which has which have a, a user interface um because uh, I think it's much more easier to just go from the command line to show the bits the inner workings. And I also will not go through comparisons of workflows. I pick something that I feel is uh, reasonable and worked for me for a long time. And I will try to, to, to tell you about that. But I also will try to explain how my view of different workflows has changed, uh, both in terms of you know, uh, maturing my, most, my stronger, stronger opinion on the topic and also about like, you know, moving to different teams, different kind of projects. All right. So maybe super quickly um, about me, um, I used to have a huge like slide with a lot of things that we're doing, but was doing before. Um, but now I've just uh, pointed you to, to the website uh, that I have, and I have also the slides there. Uh, so there is less, you know, moving around of, of files and, and, and PDFs and so on. Um, but maybe the back, uh, quickly, quick background, uh, well, I was where you are now, uh, not very long time ago, maybe depends uh, how, how we consider time. I think it was like five years ago or something like that, maybe a bit more. And so I was studying at KTH and I lived in Sweden for like uh, five, six years, something like that. Um, and um, while I was doing my last year of bachelor, I started working. I was working, had a, a, a huge amount of fun working for, for Slack, which is like a small consultancy company there. And I was working on tons of projects. I essentially ended up trying every single language tool tech and really a lot of fun. And after that, I thought, you know, life is with it is probably too good for me. Uh, I need to go some rougher place to a bit more fun. And I moved to Berlin um, like one and a half years ago. And um, I started working for a machine learning company. Uh, was quite a quite interesting topic. Uh, I was running the engineering side of it, um, but um, realized that after a while that 
didn't really fit my culture and I also was seeing some more interesting things to do and uh, that's a bit of a life advice if you start working in a place and you have other choices and you don't feel that that's the best place for you uh, yeah do yourself a favor and also to the other people and try something else it it's yeah it's a it's a better decision if of course you have the the, the, the privilege of being able to choose and um, so from the summer, I essentially run my own company with a few friends, uh, colleagues, friends, or I think the same thing at this point. And it's a bit different. It's a, it's a quantitative trading fund. So it's uh, funny enough, not anymore pure tech. I'm uh, doing a lot of finance and stuff connected to that. But it's very cool. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, well, I'm still writing a lot of code and, 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 and running software. Uh, to to support operation. So that's about me. Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe one word of warning um, about the, the topic of today as uh, of, of Git, but it's also true for any other uh, skill, especially a skill which is used when working in a team. Um, is that sometimes it's confusing and when you work with other people, you don't know what to do next, right? You don't know uh, what to do with, with Git or maybe you don't know uh, when you're building a piece of software, you don't know what's the next feature to work on. In all these cases, it's always the most important thing is, is really communicate and, and, and ask others for help or suggestion or just to sit down and, and discuss what's, what's the best way forward. This avoids creating problems and, and also builds a better culture uh, in the group. Um, so far, so good, I think. Otherwise, please stop me. Uh, another quick warning uh, that I had to add recently. Um, all the, through, throughout the whole presentation, we have this, um, this idea of master branch. You will understand what it is soon, uh, but that was the case uh, till a couple of years ago. Nowadays, it's called uh, main branch. Uh, so both Git itself and other clients or remote repositories like GitHub, GitLab, and so on have been uh, moving to this new standard. So when you see master, or if I will say master, please uh, think about main. Uh, it's just a naming convention. So it doesn't uh, change anything about the, the, the real meaning of of uh, or the real uh, understanding of the topic. All right. Um, so about the core of Git. So the the way that you that, that we think about Git. So Git is a version control system, which means that what allows us is to create this you know structured way to take snapshot of the state of our software. So we initialize a directory, a project as a Git repository. And then we have a somewhat sophisticated way to take snapshot of changes, right? In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the files, in the code over time and do in a structured way so that we can revert changes, which introduces bug or just go back to look at what we've done and also help us to work together in a team, right? So multiple people can work on different changes and then uh, ultimately get with a, a unified view of the, of the source code. So when you think about Git, you should think about um, three sort of imaginary uh, states. If you look at, at the initialized Git repository, so we have a project, we initialize as a Git repository, and, and then what? Then we have these three imaginary states. So we have the working directory, which represents how Git sees the files and folders in your project. Now we have a, um, a staging area where you kind of prepare files, right? To be, um, you, you prepare changes in files to be written in the, in, the, in the final Git history. And now we have what is actually called, technically speaking, the real Git repository, um, which is uh, a sort of chain of snapshot of changing, changes over time. So, as you may have probably done before, if you want to uh, move um, some change file or a new added file from the working directory, we will, you want to prepare it to take the snapshot of the chain, you will use the uh, command git add and then the name of the file. This will move the file to the staging area. 
and then uh, by using the git commit command you will be able to uh, create a commit which is a snapshot which comes often with a comment with a set of metadata uh, of the changes so all the changes which have been accumulated in the staging area will be inserted in the commit by default um, any questions so far all right seems no okay we have on top of this um, some commands to um, to look at what's the state of, of the whole uh, of, of the whole system so um, we there are two things that we can look at we can look at how git is seen like what's the state of the working directory and the staging area uh, through the eyes of git and that we do with the git status command or we can see a list of the co previous commits that have been made and that's we do through the git log uh, command um, again um, sometimes people start by creating a directory on their computer project and then start and then proceed with this sort of git init command you make it the git repository and sometimes you create it on github gitlab whatever you use and then you just uh, sort of download it um, and often there is the idea that the remote version the one on github is the real one is where everyone is either storing the information pushing and pulling as you will learn soon but the reality is that all git repository from a pure system perspective they are all equal there is zero difference uh, the one that you establish to be the source of truth is purely a convention in, in your team and tends to be the remote one because everyone can access while if i need to push you know from from mine to the one of my colleague that would require some sort of connection between our computers which is a bit more more, more finicky so so uh that's uh, that's reality um all right we have a question um Then maybe I will take the question as soon as I finish this small section, if it's fine, um, and I will try to, to answer. Um, was talking about sort of um, local version of repository and remote version. The idea is that um, you can have your the, a repository, a Git repository, on your machine, um, and you can have also some sort of version of the same repository on on a hosting service. GitHub. Uh, from now on, I will keep GitHub as an example since it's probably the most widely used uh, solution. Um, when you want to easily exchange data, so push or pull things between the, uh, like files and commits and and, and 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 other metadata through Git from one to the other, you want to establish a link. And the way you do that is you um, uh, add a remote, right? So means that you go on your local repository, git remote add, you give a name to the remote. Remote is like sort of a link to the remote version of a repository. And by convention, the main link you have is called origin. So git remote add origin, and then you paste the URL of your repository so that your local version of git is able to communicate with the remote version of, of, of the same repository and exchange data between the two. How to exchange data? Well, uh, if you need to take some, some new changes on your local uh, repository and move them, uh, what we call upstream, like to the remote, use the git push command. So git push where to origin my remote, what my branch master, right? Master or now main is the uh, default branch. And soon I will get more into details of what is a branch. Um, just to have a visual idea of what's happening, if you, if you look at these diagrams, um, on the left, we have a series of commits represented by, by this sort of uh, circles. And um, you should imagine that, that, um, that Git looks at, at these commits and, and, and branches, uh, are just tags are just like pointers to a specific one of these commits so the the situation was that, that maybe 
one at a certain point, uh, the, the two repositories local and remote were in sync. And then locally, I added two more commits, right? On, the, on, on my local machine. And that's the, the, the case that you can see on the left, right? So um, origin master is behind my local master, right? Origin, meaning the one, the remote counterpart of my master, local master branch is just behind of two commits. While I'm on my machine, on the master branch, I do git push origin master, and then I will end up in the scenario that is on the right, meaning that the changes from my local machine are pushed to the, uh, to the remote, and now all the remote version of master, the local one, point to the same commit. They have this essentially have the same uh, knowledge of the history of the repository. The other way around, it's pooling. And the idea is that uh, someone has added some commits and maybe pushed to the, the remote version. So the, the, the remote version has something that I don't have locally. And I use the git pull command to, to get the step data. So um, here we have a three-step scenario. Uh, on, on the left, I'm completely in sync, right? Um, then someone adds two more commits. You can, you can see them that are squared, right? So they're not the commits that I made. And these commits have been pushed to the, to the remote. So the remote is ahead of my local version. Uh, in this case, then I can use the command git pull, right? Uh, origin. And then I will be able to, the, the, the changes, the new commits will be downloaded, like, pulled on, on, my, on my machine. And now both the remote version and my local version are in sync again. Uh, I think this is one of the last point in the recap. Um, the git clone command, it's a sort of shortcut in case you only have a, a remote repository. This can be the example that you want to clone to, to get on your machine, a repository which someone has already created is on GitHub. It can be an open source project, for example, right? Like you, you, want, to, you want to clone uh, React or any other uh, library. You can just go on GitHub, search for the repository, get the URL, git clone URL, and the, the repository will be entirely uh, downloaded on your machine. All right. Um, I will try to answer the question that someone has submitted in the chat. And please uh, stop me if I'm not answering uh, what, what, what you're uh, asking. Um, and also feel free to, to ask other questions. Um, so how much, the question is, um, how much customization do you do when it comes to Git hooks? Um, do you customize how uh, commits are made or how branches are named, etc.? cetera? Um, so Git hooks are uh, sort of small, let's say script files that you can have in your repositories that integrate with Git. Um, and they allow to execute some code either before or after or in, in certain, uh, certain order to other operation that Git does. So for example, if you want to make sure that your repository is all fine uh, before you make a commit, you can do, uh, you can establish some sort of a pre-commit hook, which is so executed before the commit run is commit command runs that checks if, I don't know, the code is formatted correctly, right? And it prevents you to commit malformatted, malformed code, right? Um, now to the answer. I personally don't use Git hooks. Um, the problem with Git hooks is that they are um, hard to maintain. I would say um, I don't. I've not touched them in a couple of years. But uh, historically, Git hooks are uh, not tracked uh, easily in 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 your repository, um, and I really never had the great advantage of using them. Uh, I've been in many projects that use like some sort of library. Um, that introduce, maintain the hooks. So I think a common example is for Node.js or JavaScript or whatever, there is a library called Husky, which maintains Git hooks. So you can create your Git hooks in your uh, package or JSON or whatever manifest file you're using. And then this library inserts them dynamically into Git and use them to execute. Um, that's probably a better way than maintaining them yourself. 
but I really never use it uh, yeah, for my side. And the reason is also because I'm a really, really, really big fan of um, CI, CD and automation. And so I can do many of the things that uh, Git hooks do uh, in, a, in a continuous integration deployment pipeline afterwards. Uh, it's a bit less immediate. And I understand if you work in a huge team and you want to make sure that no one by mistake commits bad code, for example, makes sense to have hooks. But for my cases, they were never like a huge advantage. Um, did I answer the question? Uh, nice. Um, any other questions so far? No. Uh, I will ask you one question. Do you want me to show you uh, in, on my machine, on the terminal, what I've described so far? Or do you feel that you're confident enough? Uh, maybe, actually, I can do it. So also, we prepare a repo. For uh, for further uh, yeah uh, examples. So okay, um, I will move a bit around. You should be able to follow me along. Um, right. So I will create a repository locally. Um, I think you are all uh, yeah, I'm familiar with, with using the terminal. Um, uh, can you see it or should I make it bigger? Uh, anyone has a, does it work like this? Perfect, nice. So I will go on my desktop um, and I will create uh, actually um, even more realistic of, uh, <laughs> of using the terminal. I will create a Kotlin project or it's Kotlin is like Java, it's just Java modern, nicer in my opinion, but uh, same, same. Um, so let's see. Um, so creating Kotlin project, uh, I guess you had some Java course at some point. Um, it was very much evangelized when I was there. So you should know how this works. Um, and you know, I'm using IntelliJ, which is also pretty uh, common. Uh, so let's say uh, git workshop. Okay, and you can add whatever you want. Uh, yeah, you probably know how packages work. Uh, this should be right. And I create a project, and since it's IntelliJ, it's powerful and slow. Um, but uh, I think it's nice to show you with something that you may do yourself um, at some point. Uh, all right, so I use Gradle. I think Maven, uh, we have, uh, it's, it's very old and, and developers don't like old stuff. Um, so yeah, so now Gradle is just making sure that everything is fine. Um, so this project is initialized, um, is, 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 is a real Gradle project. Uh, so it has a lot of nuances, as you should know. Um, that is not a Git repository, right? So Git has not been initialized in the, in, in the file. Um, so yeah, I think now the project should be up and running and we can, um, Pull out the terminal in the in the ID. It's not usually ideal, but it does the job. Uh, yeah. So, uh, can you see the terminal in the ID? Uh, if you say no, I have no clue how to make it bigger. Oh, maybe I can try. Yeah. Oh no. Uh, okay. Cool. Love to see it. Yes. So again, the project is uh, not initialized as a Git project. So I will just type Git in it, right? Um, and I'd say it's okay initialized and take git repository in here. And my terminal it tends to be a bit smart. So it gives me a lot of information. If you have a question of what, how I'm getting that, I can go in details later. But uh, essentially now we have a git repository. There is no file that has been committed to git. Uh, if I do git uh, status, right? You will see that it says that we are on the branch main. There is no commits. And there is a bunch of files which have not been tracked, meaning that Git doesn't know about them. But also there is nothing added to commit, 
right? So that means that there is nothing which is in the staging area. So uh, what's next? Well, we want to commit the state of the repository. Um, many, of, as you can see, uh, this is a typical case where the system has generated tons of files. Probably you have, you have no clue of most of them, what they are there for. Uh, half of them, I have no clue myself. Uh, or probably I can guess, um, but uh, some of them one should include in the Git uh, repository. Some of them are generated files that can easily stay out of Git repository. And this is an important learning. If you're in a real project, not a real one, you don't want to commit everything. Some things you don't want to commit because they are contain sensitive data or secret or keys or something like that. Some things you don't want to commit because just there is, doesn't make sense to commit. They're generated on demand by your system. So IntelliJ maybe is generating some of them. So the things that you want to do is add the file, special file called uh, git ignore. And this file contains a set of rules of what files git should care of and with what set of files git shouldn't care of. Now you can write this file for yourself. Uh, and the way that you do is the following. You would just uh, create a new file um, oop, and you would give a name. Uh, dot git ignore. Um, and then for example, if you want to ignore the, uh, let's say this file, you would just add it here. And then git knows that should ignore it. And, and the ID also shows that. And if I do git uh, status again, um, then this file settings of gradable create yes is not included anymore. Uh, now, this is very boring and you may ask the obvious questions. How do I know what should be included and what should not? Now, the answer is, well, talk with your team, uh, talk with the people you work or try to go for some uh, reasonable defaults. Now, one way to, and here comes the trick. Uh, if you want some reasonable defaults, there is a wonderful website. Um, I will get it here. Uh, let's see, uh, because uh, Zoom is uh, having bars everywhere. Uh, the website is called Git. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. uh, Git Git Ignore.io. Go here, and you can say what kind of things are you using. Well, I'm using a macOS, so all the files macOS doesn't like. Let's ignore them. I'm using Gradle. Let's ignore. I'm using IntelliJ. Let's ignore it. I'm using Kotlin. Let's ignore. This will find for each category all the files which usually connect with the, that kind of category, but that uh, are not usually included in the project. Doesn't mean this is the truth, that is just some defaults. I create it, and this generates a beautiful file that I can uh, easily copy pasta over to uh, the git ignore. And now, if I do git status, I will have a bit of a smaller something. Uh, in the specific, the, the uh, um, I think the dot .cradle folder has been removed and the dot .idea folder, I think is also been selected, removed and few other things. Anyway, now we have, we have a repository, we have initialized git, we have a git ignore, let's make our first commit. I want to add all this file, so if I would want to add a single file, I would say git add, for example, uh, settings of Gradle, and that would add the single file. Now, if I do git status, I see the file again, no commits, one file ready to be uh, committed in the staging area and other files which are not tracked at all. Now I want to add all of them. So I will say git add all, right? So now git status, all the files are there to be committed. Now I want to create the commit itself, uh, git commit, and um, I want to add a message just for reference. And usual message, not very creative for my part, but it will be in it shall commit, right. Um, and git has created a commit. Now, if I do git status, uh, what I will get on branch main, nothing to commit, working tree clean, wonderful. If I do git log at this point, I will have, well, 
I have one entry in the log. Uh, the one entry saying it has, it reports to commit and, and every commit is identified by a hash. Usually the first few characters are enough to identify a commit, but there is a whole hash. There's an author, there is a date, and there is my message. It also says that the head, right? The head is what I'm looking at. If in this terminal, at what commit of my Git history I'm looking at is pointing to me. The head is at this commit, which is on the main branch. Um, Git log is wonderful. Oh, got it. Um, you can use a lot of option, uh, one line, uh, graph, decorate all, for example, and you will get a simplified version. You will see how this version is interesting. All right, uh, just last thing. Um, as I've seen that I'm going very slow, I'm on my GitHub profile. I'm gonna create a new repository called Git Workshop. Um, I will keep it public, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, I created it. And I had got a URL for it. I can copy it from here. And of course I get also easy instruction to push to this remote repository, but I will do manually. Uh, git remote add origin, and, and then I'm passing the URL. So I create a link with the remote repository, and then I can do git push origin master, I uh, mean, sorry. And let's see what happens. Nice. Then I, if I refresh, I can see all my files that have, that have been committed, right? are now in Git. And I can see in my history, there is one initial commit and there is like here, the beginning of the hash. Um, is it all clear up to now? Someone answers. Cool, all right. Then let's move forward. Um, all right, Git branches. So what's the idea of the Git branches? The Git branches allows you to maintain uh, multiple lines of development. What it means, it means that you may have a single line of development, like a sequence of commits that are your main line of development. Like you add there things that become feature in your application. But also you may want to create parallel, other parallel lines of development. So for example, multiple people in a team may want to develop their own feature, create a certain amount of commit, then all compress the commit in one single commit or even keep them as they are and merge them back into the main line of development. This allows to work in parallel and to coordinate in a team. This is a really good idea. And this actually is one of the most unique ideas to Git. Before, Git is not the first version of control system. There were others, if you ever, you ever used Mercurial, um, um, C, uh, CBN and others were, were like still there many years before, decades before Git, but they didn't have this strong opinion about branches. Branches were much more complex and cumbersome thing. While Git has this idea of branches, which is central, it's simple and it's lightweight. And this has been one of the major reasons of success. So how do you create a branch? Well, simple, Git branch, and you give a name. Very, very simple. When you create a branch, it's like as if you create a new pointer to this, uh, the commit where you're on, right? So if I'm on master and, and at a specific commit and I create a branch, I'm just kind of create a new pointer with a different name to that, uh, to that commit. But then I can, for example, change to that branch, meaning I can select the branch as my currently working branch and I can proceed independently from master adding commits to that specific branch. So, um, and, and how do, how I switch between branches is with the checkout command. So let's say that um, I create my branch and then I 
I uh, made one commit on uh, on on master, right? And so master is one ahead of, of my feature branch. Then I can switch to my feature with git check out my feature, right? And then I can add a commit to um, to the my feature brand, for example. And now we have what's called like a divergent history, meaning that the the two the two branches had an ancestor commit which was the same, and now they have each one commit which is different. Uh, at some point, I may want to reconcile this, and we will see in a, in a, in a few seconds. So um, now that exactly now that I have the idea of of these uh, branches each with their own commit, I want to reconcile them. And there are multiple ways to do that. The simplest is there of merging, and we now we look at it. And then there's the one of rebasing, which is a bit slight different. So how you merge two branches which have different commits? Well, you got get on one of them, and then you say git merge the other branch. And the other branch will be merged into the one where you are at. Uh, Two things, many things can happen, but two of them are very likely to happen. Uh, one of, of these two are very likely, is very likely to happen. Either you will have a fast forward merge, meaning that Git can easily make the merge. Like the changes in the files between the branches were not conflicted. The, the, um, actually, they are, the commits are completely independent. And um, this happens, for example, where only one of those branches has advanced. Right, um, and that's the simplest case. It's a case which never creates problem. Right, so I'm on main or master branch. I'm I create a new branch, move to it, create a commit, and then want to merge this new branch into main. Main is just back in time; it's not divergent, and hence I have what's called a fast forward merge. Fast forward because I'm just advancing uh, the history of of main branch. The other way is a, what's called a three-way merge, and it's, the end, it's exactly the case where things have been diverging. And Git will need to reconcile them and make sure that all the pieces can fit together in a coherent view of the uh, project structure, the, the changes of the project structure. Um, so again, fast forward merge, I have master and I have my feature. My feature is advanced, corresponding to master, and then now I want to merge my feature into master. So I go to master, say uh, git merge my feature. What happens is that since there is no conflicting uh, commits, this, the issue is not diverging, master will just simply be advanced to point at the same thing that my feature is. Differently, three way merge, we have the situation of divergent history. Um, and, and hence, git will need to find a way to create a new commit which carries both the history of my feature and the new commits on master. And that can be painless or painful, depends. Pain, painless means that <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's in, the, in the case where the changes in the two branches were um, across, for example, different files or didn't really, uh, they don't have anything, they don't have overlapping areas, right? Uh, can be much more painful if the two branches carry changes to both to the same files or to the same areas of code. And hence, we would have what's uh, often called a merge conflict. Um, they happen. Um, the more you get used to Git and the better you get at it, probably they will happen less and less, but uh, sometimes they happen. So, um, just get used to them and to understand how, how they work. And um, yeah, that's, that's the only thing to know. Uh, there are a lot of tools that help you to see the diffs, but the usual idea of a merge conflict is that Git will show you um, where the files are conflicting and will try and will let you pick manually which versions of specific lines you want to maintain. And then you will just add, make a new commit, and everything will, will, will go well. So how we avoid conflicts? Um, we are all pacifists and we don't like conflicts. So what we do is um, we use the idea of rebasing. The idea of rebasing is really simple, to be honest. 
And the idea is that instead of being on a branch and merging some, something into it, you want to check out to, to, to the, for example, the future branch, and you want to rebase it on top of, uh, for example, the master branch. So uh, here I will explain myself that. Uh, you have a divergent history and you fear that this will cause a conflict, right? So what you can do, you can, for example, switch to the feature branch, which has, as you can see on the left side, it has three more, three commits, which are new and not known to master. And you can say, um, git rebase a feature master, right? So you want to, um, you want to rebase uh, your feature branch on master. So git rebase master. Um, and what git will do, will try to reapply the commits of feature one by one, as if they were made on top of master. And we'll create new commits for it. New commits meaning that we'll have a different hash. In the best case, they will look, the changes in the code will look the same. Now, what's the advantage here is that Git will do apply this change one by one for the commits on the feature branch, which means that we'll also, in case there are still conflicts, will allow you to fix them one by one, commit per commit, which is usually a much better uh, outcome than, for example, a huge merge. You are merging, you know, hundreds of commits on, on the new commits on the main branch, with hundreds of new commits on the feature branch, there's most likely something that's gonna go wrong. And figuring out what it is, it's a hard part. While with, with rebasing, it will not, it will happen in a much more manageable way. And the real advantage of rebasing is if you do it all often, right? So if you don't keep your, um, uh, your branch, your feature branch diverging too much by rebasing often, I say every, every day before, you know, before finishing your, your work day, you will just check if someone added something to master and rebase on top of it. This will allow you to like, keep yourself up to date. Now, disclaimer, rebasing is very debated topic. Some teams, most of the team have been really like it. Some, I also know that really dislike it because you can end up rewriting history and losing some information. But on a general rule, it's a good idea. It keeps history much clearer. So one important thing, however, to know is that if you have a public branch and you push to remote, for example, the main branch, right? You don't want rebase. Rebase is something you do only for your own personal branches or the ones that all while you're coordinating very directly with people in your team, but rarely should be done or almost never on branch which are public or like their main branch, develop branch, branch which are used commonly by everyone in the team. Why? Uh, there is this famous gif of the pink panther that is cutting a tree and the whole ground is falling. That's a bit idea, right? Um, if you rebase, as in this picture, the, the, the master branch is almost like, you know, you're pulling the rug under your feet, right? And, and, and falling because you're kind of removing an, a part of public history and people are relying on that. So suddenly what they're relying on is not anymore the canonical part of history because it has been rewritten and rebased somewhere else. So really uh, avoid at any cost re uh, rebase of, of public branches. Is it everything clear? Please let me know with a message. Cool. I will show something of this. Um, I will write a few lines of code and then um, on a branch and then I will try to uh, to 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 merge it. All right, so let me go back to IntelliJ and you know it's freaking uh, Java so we will have a Java Kotlin same same. Um, all right, let's create a main class. I think you have done this before so there is nothing interesting here. Um, um, Kotlin is a bit smarter than Java so you don't have to create the proper class for main, uh, every main function is executable. So just to make sure that we are not saying anything stupid uh, here, 
uh, I can run this code. Uh, now we it's great at compiling things would take a few seconds um, to, to, to go up and running. But uh, here in the terminal is working. Um, we can uh, create uh, any sort of more interesting things. So um, mm, yeah, let's, uh, we can say, for example, create a function in line, uh, let's see. Uh, function uh, and then we can do something cooler and say matrix function this function uh, takes a height int and a, a width which is also int and also it takes a initialize function because we can do that so we do it um, and this function uh, wants to build the matrix. So height, and then we initialize the width. Um, all right, width. Um, and then we uh, call initialize uh, uh, side. All right, so now I guess, um, uh, here I can say well, matrix equal uh, matrix of four by three, getting linear algebra PTSD initialized with zero. Um, and uh, yeah, then we have, uh, uh, let's see, uh, whatever that gets printed uh, will be very ugly, but something will happen. Um, yeah, we can run it hopefully will not break. Oh yeah, of course, uh, I need to be a bit smarter, but I can do like this and run a debugger and I should be able to see something inside the matrix. So as you can see, we have uh, a, um, a matrix of height four of which, uh, and with three, everything initialized to zero, right? Um, I hope that makes sense just to write something better than print hello world. Okay, so this change, I don't want to commit it on main. So I will check out a new branch. Now I can do a git branch and uh, I can call it feature. You will see why, uh, matrix, for example. And that would be fine. This would create a branch, but um, yeah, let's do it. So you can see. It. So if I look at uh, what I've done and I've just used a small command to print uh, the, the, the logs, git logs in a bit nicer way. The only thing that has happened, I'm still on main. I still have my origin main, which points at GitHub. And now I have a new branch called feature matrix, which is kind of pointing at the same commit. Now you will understand soon what it means if i do git checkout um, feature matrix now i'm looking at feature matrix so if i do this i'm my head which is essentially what i'm looking at feature matrix cool now git add uh, and uh, i will commit add matrix function cool um, oh, sorry, I've added all the files because that was the only change and I get CI is just a small uh, alias for git commit on my computer, but the same would have been git commit, uh, it's a muscle memory. So um, if I look at the state of the, uh, the git sort of uh, logs or trees, um, you can see that I have an initial commit, which is on the main branch, that has also a counterparty remote in GitHub. And now I have a, a matrix function, a matrix function, the new commit, which is on the feature matrix. Now, um, what, um, what I want to do is, um, let's see, I want to merge the two, right? So um, I can do a, a 
just simple merge. So how would a simple merge? I will go to uh, main, uh, git checkout main, and then I can do git merge feature metric. Uh, this is what makes most sense here because there's been no advancement in the history, but otherwise it would make sense to have, uh, if something else would have been committed in the meantime on main, then um, it would make sense to rebase. Uh, I will simply merge. Uh, it just makes sense. And well, Git is telling me fast forward, easy peasy. Um, if I now look at how the history looks like, again, now main and feature matrix, the point they have all the same commits. Of course, I've not pushed this change yet to uh, GitHub. So if I go uh, here, and I go down the rabbit hole of refreshing and looking at the, uh, you, do, you don't see any source folder. Uh, Git doesn't include by default folders, uh, but if I'm now gonna push um, and uh, yeah, sorry, uh, just add this. Yep. Uh, now I can go on GitHub, refresh and source main Kotlin and my main file is actually inside. Cool. Um, just quick housekeeping. Um, I want to remove the branch that I created here. So git branch delete feature matrix. And now I can look at my git history. There is no more trace of the feature. Match. All right. Um, is everything clear? Is any question? Any question? Seems everything clear. Great. Then I think we can give ourselves uh yeah maybe till uh, 13 15 uh break and just uh, see you then so we we're gonna look into more workflows sounds good maybe yeah leave also nice um so back to the slides. Um, again, um, now we, we've been seeing like flows which are very on, on a very personal level as a developer, how I manage things. Now look, let's look more into the collaboration side because that's the main benefit ultimately of, of something like, um, like Git. And, and we will look at it uh, through the lenses also of GitHub again, um, I, I it's a pers personal choice what tool you use. Um, I, I, I like GitHub. Uh, I think it's probably the most used, so it makes sense to show that uh, if you have, if you are a crazy fan of uh, GitLab or Bitbucket or ET, uh, because everything must be self-hosted, otherwise it's not yours. That's that's fine as well. Uh, you will find more or less the same workflows. So, um, forking and pull request. So. The idea of fork um, is uh, to create a copy of a repository, but it's a bit more nuanced and, and it's really close to the idea that you want to, for example, you're on GitHub and you see a repository created by Facebook for React and you want to make some changes uh, starting from, from the current state of the React repository. Then of course you don't want to work on uh, React repository. Uh, you can't do that. Uh, Mark is not allowing you to do that. Uh, so what, what you want to do, want you, you want to create a fork. So you want to create a copy on your account of that repository at the time. And it's very easy to do, for example, through GitHub and the most of providers support very easy way to do it. And you just press a button and this copy will be created. Uh, what is more interesting is how you would orchestrate all the flows so that you will be able to work on your fork while also keeping um, updated the changes which are continuously added on the 
original repository, but that's I think it's a it's a topic for 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 another time uh, or, or just for you to to look into. Um, so this is simple. Uh, if you go on GitHub, there is a fork button, and you can go on the repository and and and, and fork. So uh, nothing crazy there. Um, there are some people, for example, are very uh, concerned that uh, they would some repository would be removed, right? So so you're relying on some code on some library. And you are concerned that the company that is maintaining it will remove it at some point, then you create your own fork, right? So that can also be a reason. What's a pull request? So pull request was is a very, very old idea. And um, is the idea that you have developed some code independently and you want this code to be added back into the main uh, the main line of development. This was initially done with um, patches three mail. So, so um, you know, if you think about development of a Linux, right, operating system, uh, the, the core contributors were creating um, uh, small changes in code. They were like, you know, bundling them. And then they were sending through the mailing list, these bundles, people were reviewing them, and then eventually adding if, if deemed useful to the main uh, core uh, uh, line of development. Nowadays, it's much a simpler process. We have UIs for that. For example, GitHub is an excellent one. Uh, you can just uh, create a, easily a pull request. And the pull request is not just like asking others to review and add your code. But it's the opportunity for you to open a, a more like public, either public in terms of the team you're working on, the company you're working on, or even the whole internet about what should be changed, added, removed, implemented, right? So it's a great place for discussions to uh, to 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 um, yeah to interact with others and eventually also to change your implementation that you're suggesting based on that feedback. So pull request, for example, allows you to you know set it up with a certain amount of commits, but then add commits dynamically to it. Uh, so, so as for example, based on some feedback. So this is very easy. Um, I can quickly show you uh, again uh, through GitHub. So as you can see the um, the way that we're printing the metric, the, the matrix was very miserable. Actually, we're getting like a GBM reference, memory reference, because uh, this matrix is done as a, you know, um, array, is in, array inside array, whatever, uh, of, of a certain dimension. So we want to print in a nice way. So, okay, easy. Um, again, Kotlin has you covered uh, for each. Um, I guess that's the thing, row. Uh, then for each row, uh, for each column, right? Um, and here we want to, I guess, print the uh, column and gain string of classinations, beautiful. Um, and then we probably want to uh, print. Um, Let's do something like this and this. So uh, maybe like that. Okay, I have no clue what they've written, like most of the developers do. So I will just uh, try to run it and see what happens. Oh, well, that's uh, it's very surprising. Right, the first time never happened before. Anyway, um, so here I've made a new change and now I want to um, make a pull request with this change. So first of all, the first thing I want to do is um, create a branch. This time I will do with a trick. Uh, I will use the checkout B feature uh, print uh, matrix, for example. Uh, this is essentially combining checkout and branch. So I'm both creating a branch and checking out it. Um, so as you can see now on that branch, I add all my changes, easy. Uh, git commit m a better print of matrix. Cool. And now I want to, now, of course, I want to make a pull request to GitHub. So now this time I need to push this branch to, um, to GitHub. Now, either you know the command or you're like me, incredibly lazy and you write push and Git tells you that it doesn't know what you are doing and suggest something which is usually very reasonable. So you are pushing um, 
the, the changes, but in the meantime, you're also kind of creating a remote branch and setting a link between your current branch and your remote branch. So just repeat this command that Gita suggested is creating a remote version of feature print matrix. So on origin, meaning on GitHub, and it's uh, linking it to my local version of feature print matrix and also pushing at the same time. I'm doing it, great. So now I can go to GitHub and uh, yeah, see. So um, you don't, here you see the branch and now you see there is a new branch, right? And the new branch, uh, if I go into details, has to change, right? Now what I can do, I can go to pull request and again, very smart. Um, GitHub is suggesting me to compare and open a pull request because I've seen that I just pushed a new branch. And so it's predicting that one of the next thing I will do is create a pull request, or I can do create a new pull request. The base is the main branch compared to this feature. And I can see also the difference in real time, which is very, very handy. Really, really great uh, possibility. And I will do create a pull request. So when I create a pull request, I can add some comments. Um, um, so for example, uh, use uh, row column printing, doesn't mean anything, but just an example. Uh, I can see the changes uh, and I can also do a lot of other things. I can add labels. So for example, this is an enhancement, right? And I can add reviewers. So if other people are into this repository, meaning that in added either as collaborator or if this repository is part of an organization and I want to add them, this is GitHub feature, just be aware. Uh, very similar to what others have, but it's GitHub feature. Uh, I can create a pull request. And this is great. So GitHub is also looking that there is no issue to, uh, to merge this one. And, and that's it. And here people can comment and suggest ideas. Um, and when uh, I'm, we, we all agree on what's, on what's a decent version. Um, so by the way, they can also review the, the diff of, of the changes, but when we agree on what's the ultimate um, state of the feature as it should be merged, then I can just press merge pull request, confirm merge and um, done now this change is in the main branch i can also in a handy way remove the the branch that i created the remote counterpart and if i now uh, go to uh, master main sorry um and i do git pull i will pull the changes so now as you can see in in in, in my uh, nice way of, of printing the git tree i see that i was at this point, I created a branch, I pushed it to, to GitHub, and then I merged the pull request. And when I merged, GitHub has created a new commit, right? Say called merge pull request number one, which contains, is a three way merge because it contains the, um, well, kind of was more fast forward in this case, but uh, it created a proper commit, uh, which contains the, the ultimate state of the, of the code or the directory. And also, if I now do git remote prune origin, it also removes the link, the remote version of the feature print matrix. Because if you remember, I press the button uh, delete branch. So the remote version has been deleted. So the only thing that remains to do is just for housekeeping to remove my local version of the branch, git branch delete feature matrix, did it. Now I have a very clean history, which also tracks the fact that some code was developed in a separate branch and ultimately merged into the main source. All right, hope everything is clear so far. Um, yeah, uh, let me maybe try to get your chat up. Nice, cool. In case you want to ask questions, um, yes, workflows. Um, so again, um, there is no perfect workflow. Uh, I change so many over time, and I also the one that I use personally change over time. 
Um, just agree if you work in a team, what well, can be your student working group, can be a company, just try to agree on something that works for everyone and everyone is happy. Um, so, um, yes. The one that I, however, I would like to show you is kind of modified version of Git flow. Uh, and uh, Git flow is, uh, is widely used and it ultimately a set of conventions to identify branches, for example, and a set of ways that you proceed while you create new branches and you want them to be merged, essentially. So branch convention. So master, nowadays main, uh, always represent your, your indeed main branch, right? That, that's where, that's your main line of development. And in cases, for example, you're developing an app that then runs on server, then main often for many team reflects the state of the production server. It's like what the people that use your application see. Not always the cases, many different ways to see this problem, but a simple and widely used one is this. Main master is what is live on a server, for example, or the version of the app that has been released to that store. If you're developing the app, uh, now mobile app code this. Develop, um, I used to, disclaimer, I used to have developed branch all the time when I was in university and a lot of times when I was working. Nowadays, I never use it, but it's usually in a larger team makes sense. So uh, you, uh, it, it's a branch that originates from master, I mean, and this is where development happens. What it means is that you will continuously create feature branch out of develop and merge them back to develop. When a critical mass of features have been introduced and developed, you maybe maybe do some sort of early release from develop, you will test from develop, and then at certain times you will merge into master develop, right? So take develop push into master and then make a release. This is for example the case that you want to have a continuous development on of the application, you want continuously to test it, have beta users and so on, but then you want every now and then to make a proper release, right? Like that's a very common use case, for example, for mobile application, right? If you, if you don't see much information about updates of websites, like it's not that you care if, you know, using Facebook uh, B260.1.7, but if for mobile apps, if you go on the Android Play Store, on the App Store, you can see there's a version number, right? This can be a case, right? Oversimplified, but that's, that's uh, the idea. Um, all right, so so um, that's how you can represent them ultimately, right? So again, few commits on the main master branch, all version. You can you can use tags. You can look up what tags are in GitHub. They're very handy, uh, and a lot of development happening on the on, on develop branch. Feature um, is to uh, is used to when you want to add a new feature, right? So you will as as you've seen me doing. You will be on develop or main, depends how you structure your things. And you just say, okay, git checkout branch or git branch feature, feature, and then you give a name. Please name a uh, lowercase using dashes, not underscores, not comic case, the usual agreed across most of the open source projects. That's the, that's the, the format. Uh, you prefix with feature so people know what they're, what they're looking at. If you have hundreds of branches, you know, is the bag fix, is it release, what it is. It's a feature, right? So everyone understands. Uh, origins from develop, merge into develop, right? Possibly short leave is a good idea. Um, so a lot of feature branches done by many people, very common. Um, release branch not use much, actually had more problems than benefit from this, but some teams use it, right? And the use case I will show you to the image is that um, you have enough features on develop that make sense to be released, but uh, now your team enters a testing phase. So part of the team is busy continuously developing, adding commits to, to develop, and some and half of the team is busy testing and fixing last bugs before they release. So if you want to avoid some sort of collision between the work of the two teams, you create a small release branch out of develop, which will not contain any new feature, just fixes and adjustment pre-release. Then you will use release branch to actually merge into master and release, 
and you also will merge it back into develop. So develop will also carry those changes and make sure that if you fix some bug, it's also fixed and developed since people will continue to build on it. Again, not super fundamental. I think uh, the main branch and the feature branch are much more important. Develop somewhat, release, not really crazy uh, important. Last one, bug fix, hot fix, ah, heard many in many ways. Um, if you if your team is developing on develop on feature branches, but suddenly you have the fatal bug bug, what do you do? Well, you can create a hotfix uh, branch. Hotfix branch very debated how it should be handled. This is really hard to team, but the idea is that is a very 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 short lived branch. The only purpose is to create a commit that fix one specific critical bug. Right. Um, it often is created out of uh, me because or master because the idea is that you know your user are angry, right? Something is really not working, and but the whole idea is that you kind of create it uh, for that purpose, and then you you as soon as you know that solves the problem, you merge it back into main master and develop. Um, so very short lived branch, but again, every team has its own. Uh, uh, idea. Uh, hot fix sometimes is called bug fix. Hot fix is really, really problematic uh, uh, bug, right? So it's instantaneous, you know, merge main, merge develop. If you have like sort of feature branch, which actually is fixing a bug, what did, didn't go yet in production, didn't get yet merged into main, then instead of doing feature, you call it bug fix. So bug fix is really just fixing something. Hot fix is fixing something which is critical and live. But again, um, this is just a general standard. Um, so what's the big picture out of all of these? Uh, as a maintainer, right? Uh, let's say that you form a group of people, um, in, for example, for this course, and you need to, 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 to develop a project. And one of you in the group will create the repository, possibly locally on, uh, on, 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 on their machine. Right, add some configuration file, maybe some nice readme file, which, which displays what's the repo about. Always important readme file. A git ignore, so we don't check in stupid things like, like Mac, Mac OS. I, I don't know other operating system, I use Mac for a very long time, but like other operating system uh, and, and also Mac have some weird files, uh, like this yes.store, like if you've probably seen it, it's very common for Mac, like some reference files, and you don't want to check in this stuff. So just create a git ignore as early as possible. Um, and you make a commit, right? So the first, you, have, you have a project, initialize a repo locally, commit few files, is ready. Then you can push it to the remote, right? So you push it to GitHub, for example. So you, you do what I've done so far, um, create a repository online, you find the, the URL, you add the remote and you push. Then the other people in the team will pull, right? So they will pull from that remote, right? So they will just, for example, clone the repository from GitHub to the machine, and they will uh, have it there, or if they already have it, they will just pull. Um, someone's ringing doorbell, but whatever. Um, the developers then will work on their uh, own features, right? So, uh, and they will work on their own features on their own branches. Uh, and make plenty of local commits, for example. Um, and then what? Then they will take their own branches, right? And push them to the remote, right? So they will push them to GitHub. Their branches containing the new commits. Um, so, so they push the branches, but they don't want to merge directly into main, right? That's very rude. Uh, what you want to do, is make a pull request. So you push the branch, you go on GitHub as I've done, and you create a pull request. Then the other developers will um, continuously review this pull request, make sure that the code is fine, that there's no breaking change. Eventually, if you will get into continuous uh, integration, uh, yeah, CI CD and develop, uh, deployment, you will probably have some pipelines running, other things, test running, all these beautiful things. But then when the uh, pull request is ready, will be 
uh, merged, right? So, so people will approve this request, pull request if it's fine. And usually the person that's created will have the honor uh, or burden to merge it into the main code base. And then let's not forget, everyone will need to pull again the latest changes. Um, so this is the flow. Um, and this is very commonly used, uh, very, very commonly used. Um, so, and that's what would advise, for example, a small team to work with. Um, I had a small part on debugging with Git. Um, I can super quickly go through, um, uh, but um, not super important. Uh, we have this concept of uh, Git blame. Just for you to know, there is a way to just look at the specific file and see who introduced each changes. Um, uh, I think it's a bit rude to call it Git blame. Is, you know, it should be maybe nicer people, but uh, that's the of the feature. Um, and you can do both from the uh, command line, uh, from, from just on the repository, but you can also do much more easy from GitHub, which are you probably. Um, and the other things you can do is use something called bisect. This is the kind of thing which is great if you are very expert and you're run, working on a huge complex software, usually is really not needed. And the idea is uh, if you have a bug and there have been plenty of commits since, so imagine that you deploy every month, right? A new version of a mobile app, right? And you don't know, and at a certain point you find a bug. And you know that last month was not there. This month is there. So in between, there are a few hundreds commits. Who's the one that introduced, uh, which is the one that has introduced the bug? You can search, maybe you have good ideas and you should go for that. But if you really can find, there is an idea of bisect and essentially Git will guide you through using binary search, uh, choosing, um, yeah, you would, you, 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 you would see you will start to bisect uh, between two ranges of com uh, in a range of commits, and, and and Git will let you test one half and the other half, and it will tell you is the first half good? No, that means that has been introduced in the second half. Then we'll take the second half and we'll split in half. You will essentially use binary search and to to drill down and find the the, the buggy commit. Sounds great, sounds smart, but it usually you will be able to find things much easily if you know the project well, right? But in case there are hundreds of, uh, or thousands of commits, then makes sense to drill down a bit more uh, with such tool. This is all what I want to talk about. Um, maybe one more thing um, I had in mind, uh, which is uh, quick, what I've learned like going over six, seven years, right? Um, using first Git with my, uh, you know, course mates in KTH, then in very different teams, as small as, uh, you know, someone developing three people, the website for a public library in Sweden to like a team of Spotify. Uh, then what did change when I worked um, in a team which included a lot of data scientists, which have very, very different skill set seems that you know data science and software engineers very similar but actually it's really really different with people work and now that i work in a very small like like three people team that is churning out much more than i used to do in a 20 people team because well, we work close we work together and we know what we want to do so what's the learning again the learning is the obvious thing says that there is no right uh, flow there's no right system uh, you really and never commit to something, never think that because you've used something before and it worked, uh, something else cannot work better. Or because Simone told you that this is a standard flow, that's the one that's gonna work for you. No, it's always worth it to try and change if things are not working well. So that's the first, first idea. But also I had um, a move towards pragmatism, right? Uh, you start, that, that's a bit of, of, a, of a journey that everyone has going, especially from, from university to work. You start with a lot of ideas of, of things that are right and wrong, but then you end up with things that just work, right? Um, so I had these beautiful workflows in my mind and so on, but ultimately I need to, you know, commit fast, make sure that 
everyone is on top of things and everything works. And I think that's that's what one should choose, right? Um, it's always good to have in the back of your mind what are good practices, but ultimately nothing substitutes just being able to do, be able to deliver and making sure that everyone in the team works well. And the last thing, which is a bit more biased thing to say, but I think it's important is um, now I'm spending a lot of time on GitHub, right? Um, and, and the reality is that the more you get sophisticated, the more things you want, not at the core of Git or the version control system, but around it, right? Uh, now I give for granted that myself and the other people in the team knows how to use well Git. That's a given, right? And no one is even thinking about that. Sometimes something we joke because maybe someone messed up the history, but beyond that, it's a given. What really matters is everything around how we manage pull requests, right? Uh, how we do continuous integration, right? So now if you need to do continuous integration, nowadays we have GitHub Actions, which are inside GitHub. I, I use any CDCI system in the pod existing, but nowadays I'm using GitHub Actions just because they are inside GitHub, convenience, right? Not because they're better or I like them more, like, okay, I guess, uh, but they're convenient, they're inside, it's a few click away, they integrate with GitHub, so I want my PR to show red if the continuous integration pipeline fails the test, if the, for, if the code is not formatted. I want to have specific rules on who can approve pull requests, right? I want to have dependabot, which is a small script run by GitHub that updates automatically my dependencies, right? All these things have suddenly become more important, fun enough, than the core use of it. It's not more important, it's just that using Git has been a given all the extra, uh, you know, performance and, and ease of development coming from automation. Now I'm squeezing it out, not of it, but of what's on top of it. And of course, if you use GitHub, it has tons of things on the side. Many, most are overlapping with GitHub Bitbucket pipelines. And, and so it's not just a GitHub thing, but what the system, the process built around it, bring to developers, start mat mattering a lot, right? So that's something that, you know, we always say we shouldn't rely crazy on tools. You, you know, we should use interchangeable tools, not commit forever. But reality is that my job as a developer is not to, you know, uh, have strong opinions and, 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 and just stick to, to, to ideals, is to deliver working high quality code at the end of the day. And every tool that allows me to improve in a meaningful way, it's what matters, right? So, so that's that's the realization that I had in, in the past maybe one, one two years. Um, yeah, infrastructure as a code is another idea, and you know Terraform, the beautiful things if you've heard of them. Uh, yeah, having Docker and, and uh, pre-installed in the repository so you can run it straight away. All these things start mattering. Now. So that's what everything I want to say. Um, now, questions. Uh, there is 50 minutes. We don't need to use all of them if you don't want to, but if you have questions, uh, write in the chat, raise hand. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to just speak up. Any sort of question, even about my job or whatever. Take the opportunity to ask uh, Simone whatever you don't have. Of, not, it's not every day you get the opportunity to, to have an experienced developer just sitting here waiting for questions. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, just go ahead. Uh, uh, I was I was thinking about asking about Terraform, and uh, now that you mentioned about it. Oh yeah. Uh, I was thinking, what in what scenario are you using a Terraform? Because I know the Terraform kind of automate the deployments, right? Yeah. So yeah. when it comes to smaller project or bigger projects. Yeah. Um, yes. So. Again, disclaimer, I'm a massive Terraform fanboy, so uh, I take it with a grain of salt. Uh, actually, I mean, in general, like, so, so uh, Terraform is a product by this company called HashiCorp, 
is a company that, in my opinion, has extremely high quality open source infrastructure tools, right? Uh, others are Nomad, Console, Background, Packer, uh, Bolt, uh, and Terraform is one of them. So what Terraform allows you to do is, um, just as a simple example, you want to run a server and the with, with a database. So you have a backend application which needs a database. And you decide to run it on AWS or Google Cloud Platform. Let's pick Google Cloud Platform because that's what I use most of the time. Um, so on those, if you, if you normally use this, this, this cloud solutions, you go on the UI, right? And you click through the UI and you know you provision a machine, right? Like a build from machine or like uh, nowadays you have this kind of serverless thing. So you have like, you know, pass or whatever. And then you provision database and then somehow you connect the two of them and that's, that's your infrastructure. Now, what's the obvious problem? The obvious problem is that uh, you are not keeping trace of what you've done, right? Uh, there is no way, let's say that, that for, by mistake you wipe the project where you did this, then you need to remember what you did, go create another project and, and do that from scratch. That's not ideal, right? That's not what we want. So what Terraform allows you to do is to write some sort of code using some sort of uh, adapters, plugins, which connects to the, GitHub, to the GCP or to the AWS or to the Azure APIs and does this sort of provisioning and configuration for you, right? So what you will do, you will write a code and say, I have a piece of code that creates a machine with the specification. There's a piece of code that, that, that creates a database with a specification. And there's another piece of code that's connects the two of them, right? And then you will tell Terraform to plan and Terraform will make a plan of how, what this will result in changes in their real infrastructure. And um, if you are pleased with what you see, you will be able to apply this plan, right? Uh, and you will apply it and Terraform will actually create in the cloud for you these things and be careful because they cost money. But, but if you're on top of how things work and you have quotas, it should be always fine. And, and this is ideal because if, you know, everything falls apart, then you have still like in a file, which of course you can store, you, you can use Git, right? And you can store in GitHub. In a file, you have the whole configuration of infrastructure. Does it make sense for a small project? If you want to have fun and you feel confident, yes. Usually, no. Um, so, um, makes sense for larger projects. And in the project I'm working now, for example, uh, we have few dozens of thousands uh, resources in the cloud. And we probably spend two, three hours in two people like a month to keep an app running. Well, that would take, like, I would need one full-time person to do that if I would not use Terraform. But we are using Terraform for everything. We have even Terraform that configures GitHub. So in GitHub, there's a repo that configures the whole organization in GitHub itself, just to how, how much inception we, we got into. And I use Terraform for really everything because I really like it. I really clicks with me, um, but, uh, but you, you shouldn't necessarily, right? But more and more team in general moving towards infrastructure as code in general is a benefit, especially if things get large. Just um, maybe uh, since it's a um, follow up, the Docker Compose versus Terraform um, thing, uh, they're very different, right? Um, Docker Compose is a way that you can, uh, if you have multiple services, which, um, um, multiple services which can be wrapped in a Docker image. I don't know if you know Docker, if you've tried it, but it's this kind of way of creating containers or like sort of wrapped application services. Docker Compose allows you to like put them together and have a single file that provision them. But that has nothing to do with infrastructure. It's nothing to do with the application. They actually kind of complementary. Or like at least Docker and Terraform are very complementary. Like Terraform is also used a lot with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is kind of the Docker compose on steroids. Um, still, since I follow up, I will still uh, <laughs> uh, reply to that. I'm using Terraform GitHub Action or do it locally. Uh, shame to say locally, um, should be done with, with also in the CI, for example, in GitHub Actions, uh, it's always better. I do locally because currently the work I do requires tons of security 
and for many reasons it becomes very complicated how terraform what terraform can access across my organization but in general should be done in a ci github action or whatever um just um maybe um some other quick questions that were asked through the chat uh we'll keep it short so um we can end in time uh what are you using kotlin for and how it is different than standard java um so when i, I was in kt8 i was fighting so bad to get rid of java um and to get into python and now i feel that i'm fighting so bad to get rid of any sort of python and have used for everything like kotlin or java which tells you how things change in life um so the the thing with java is that it's we use it for a reason it's robust is hold is battle tests and and it's kind of you know I mean, a big functional programming uh, i really like functional programming but object oriented programming really reflects the world it's a much easier way to model the world and that's why it makes sense now of course the things i don't like of java is few of them it's like one it doesn't have much support for functional programming inside the language uh, second a concurrency is very painful like the whole threading things it always feels that has been an af afterthought and the syntax is very that's many people say verbose or redundant um cotton is JVM, jvm language right um is developed by jet by jet Brains, the same people that do intellij and is very popular i mean this is the default nowadays language for android uh it has the things that java doesn't have for me right it has a much nicer syntax um and it has a wonderful concurrency and 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 it also has wide support for functional programming and the concurrency especially is great they use something called coroutines which is really really if you have used Gol golang for example uh it's 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 resonates a bit it's, it's really really nice and nowadays cotton is he very heavy on server side there's a lot of support uh, not as much as i would like and also is multi-platform meaning that you can create a desktop mobile web application soon uh, web assembly all from some sort of shared core uh, code base. It's, it's really good, uh, tons of support. I really like it. But as every tool is, you know, probably 20% what is good at and 80% personal taste. So don't want to, to shill the tool more than this. Um, um, yes. Um, <clears throat> Um, so maybe the simplest one is again about language. The one the other question about C. Do I see? Uh, do I see C used a lot outside there? Uh, I've never been a good um, uh, embedded like uh, embedded system developer, and, and I've, I've been TA in, in in David Broman's course for for very long. But but uh, to be honest, I'm, I, it's not where my passion goes all the time. Um, I use a lot of C in the KTH and, and a bit outside, um, and so I'm, I'm no one to judge if it's used a lot. I know I have a few friends working now at Apple, and they say that they use it uh, a lot still, uh, C++. However, um, for example, when I re need to reach something which is in the same ballpark of C nowadays, I use Rust, right? Everyone talking about Rust, Rust is good, Rust is perfect, it's not perfect, but it's good um so that's about c and this is about also the idea that um uh well maybe c is really really low level so certain really low level things c helps even more than rust but 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 rust covers a wide portion of that range and again you know time changes needs evolve and we should also be flexible to that we'll never die billions of lines of code are written in c and will probably be kept uh, like that but a uh, new software would probably tend, the feeling I have is tending towards more like using Rust. Um, it, it, you know, I think some, something to, to be aware of with, with tools and, and languages that they all incentivize different behaviors, right? And, you know, mistakes are done by developer, but the responsibility to incentivize good or bad behaviors are the tool. And for example, we are all aware that the behaviors that incentivize regarding memory and how memory is managed in C, isn't because of how old it is, it's not as good as it could be these days. And Rust has put a lot of effort, for example, to solve the site. So that's that's something to keep in mind as well. 
Um, and the question, more gen the more general question, what would uh, what advice would I give to some that is starting their job as a developer? How to feel uh, as prepared as possible? Um, I mean, again, um, I'm probably going to say some obvious things, but um, you know, you don't learn to swim on books, right? So, so why we should learn to program on books? Uh, uh, so, I think uh, for for, um, for yeah, it's it's really fundamental to really put the time and and build things, right? Um, many things sounds very scary. For example, I always felt absolutely terrified about contributing open source projects, but some of them are small enough. You may even get to know the community very tightly because you like that. Um, and, and so contributing open source, building your own things, build your own portfolio, sort of portfolio on GitHub, like as a photographer would do, uh, with, with, with a photo book, right? Um, and, and, uh, yeah, and, and just, just exploring. I think that's really the, the highest uh, reward uh, in terms of, of getting closer to the market. And, and sad to say, uh, you know, also be prepared at some point to be disappointed because, you know, you will send out a lot of, you know, CVs and, and resumes and people will just ignore them. It sucks. It's terrible, I think. Um, but that's also the thing, right? Um, also be prepared of, of, of doing, a, if this question is also about getting the job, I don't know, uh, be prepared to do a lot of terrible, uh, you know, brain teaser exercises. They are completely useless for your job, but uh, companies think they're very smart. And, you know, uh, some people take the word as they wish they want it to be. Some people take it as they are, as it is the word. So you probably need to take as it is. So since they're used, you, yeah, better get good at it and, and, and you know, win your first interview or whatever. Um, or whatever it is. Um, in terms of what you should do as a first job, uh, I don't know, maybe you have a certain area where you have a passion. Uh, something that worked very well for me was the, doing this time in a sort of soft, hands-on software consultancy, not consultancy making slides, like you know, PowerPoints, but like working, going into a team and helping out to build. That was very useful for me because I could try everything in a very short amount of time. Not everything, but a lot in a short amount of time. So that's maybe something if someone is not sure what they would like to do, it's a good way to explore. I mean, again, I, I will I would recommend like Hisaren. I love to work with them. I know that they are always active with, with students, but also, I mean, NetLight, there's tons of comp that, 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 that do these things and it's always worthy, in my opinion. How much do employers look at side projects uh, or hobby projects? Uh, sadly, not enough, in my opinion. Um, it's always also easy to fake, to be honest, like uh, having stuff in GitHub, but the passion of a side project is really hard to fake. Um, and, and, and I would love to see much more than that personally, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so not enough, but definitely. And again, also when you will, when you will go to an interview, it's not about, like, I, I always thought that interview was about, you know, to tell, um, you know, to solve some exercise on the whiteboard and, and you know, tell my resume. And, uh, and the reality is like, it's some much better interview if you just find some interesting thing that you've done to talk about with the interviewer and just have a, you know, easy conversation over, over a cup of coffee with the interviewer and, and just, you know, tell and, and people will be able to evaluate your level much better. Uh, and, and, and you also build a better relation with a person and, and I think that's, and also you're a bit proud of what you built, right? So it's, it's, it doesn't only show the skills, but also shows the enthusiasm, which is, yeah, I think is a big plus personally. Um, but yeah, that's my way of seeing and the way that I, when I was interviewing people at like that, 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 that we used to do, but I think many other companies do the same. Um, Right. I will send, uh, if there are no more questions, um, we are also have a time. I will um, send uh, maybe the links you can find on my website, but I send everything to, to late so you can, uh, you can find them. Hope you uh, enjoyed this and uh, yeah, good luck uh, with everything, with the course and of course with your, uh, yeah, other 
new adventures, whether it's a job, a side job, or like university. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs>